Um, I really appreciate it. Today's my oh, recordings in progress. Got it. So thanks so much for coming today. Um, I, uh, a little bit about myself. I'm from California. Originally, I went to University of California, Irvine over there. Uh, then I went to um, uh, uh, um, in, uh, in, in Israel, um, where I studied at the Sacra School of Medicine. And then from there, I came uh, back to, to New York now on Long Island, and uh, I'm doing a residency. It's a combined residency in internal medicine and pediatrics. Um, so uh, it's uh, a six year residency, kind of like fast track into a four year residency. Um, it's kind of like family medicine, but there's less um, ob and more pediatrics. Um, and it's more inpatient hospital centered. Uh, more ICU time, more general floor time, more ER time. Um, yeah, so that's what I'm doing now. I'm in my third year out of four. And at the end of this year, I'll be applying to fellowship in another combined program. It's called pulmonary medicine and critical care. So I'll be working in the ICU. And uh, as long as I get in, I'll be working in the ICU. Uh, and I'll be uh, a pulmonologist. So essentially, I'll be a specialist of the lungs. And um, that means I can uh, help people out with different sorts of lung conditions, do bronchoscopies, um, you know, diagnose lung conditions using kind of the same thing that they do uh, for colonoscopies with a, a long scope. Um, and, you know, ventilators, helping people's uh, lungs breathe while they're uh, sick and ill. Um, so I'm very excited. It's very fun. And uh, I'm very lucky to have gone through this journey. Um, the, the, you know, the medical school path is a, is a long one and not everyone, uh, gets into it and even makes it. Um, what's, what's most important is I've had a really great support system. Um, I've had a good drive to practice medicine. Um, you know, I, I think my reasoning for going into medicine is what kind of gets me up every morning, gets me fighting every morning to continue doing this because it's, it's just so long. Um, and it's, uh, the hours are rough but it's, it can be such a rewarding career. And um, yeah, I, I'm really blessed to have, you know, uh, you know been on this journey and, and still on this journey. And that's why I do these sessions. I've done, I don't know, 10 or 11 of these now with different organizations and each one is better than the next. Um, I, you know, I love these small chats. It looks like there's about, I don't know, 10 of us here, which I think is perfect because instead of me just chatting your heads off, I can answer your direct questions. You can ask a resident who's been through this process exactly what you want to know rather than going on Google and just like saying, oh, can I trust this person who commented on this one forum on Reddit? You know what I mean? Okay. So that being said, um, I can easily just like pop open, share my screen and we can like go over like a case. I have like so many reports that I've done with, you know, PowerPoints and we can do a practice case, but I would rather not do that. And I would rather ask, you know, answer your questions. Um, I'm trying to think, what else do I do? I do research now. I do a lot of COVID like last year. Um, uh, I'm very much into academics and teaching and instruction. Uh, I'm very much into like up-to-date research. Uh, I have a 110 pound dog named Zeus. Uh, um, Ask some questions. Let's see what you got to say. Who's up first? You can raise your hand if you want, or just turn your mic on. Yes, uh, you can raise your hand, write the questions in the chat, or just directly speak to Dr. Grossman. Yeah, yeah. if you prefer to you know, send a message in the chat if you don't want to talk. OK, here we go, from Jennifer Kirschman. Um, let's see. Uh, what do you like most about your specialty? So uh, this is good, good. This is a good talking point. So I think what I like about my specialty made sense for me. So, so first of all, I'm a type one diabetic. So I've been in and out of the medical system or rather in the medical system for a large part of my life. So um, I because of it and I have you know, been in the outpatient setting healthy. Um, so I've kind of experienced all depths of it from a kid to an adult. So that's why for me, um, internal medicine, pediatrics was a really cool option. Now, most people just do one. So this is a weird specialty. I don't want you to take what I'm doing as like what most people do. I think med peds as kind of the nickname for it 
is a very different specialty. Um, but it's also very similar to a lot of specialties that are single year. So if you look at in emergency medicine, you, you know, you work with adults and kids uh, in the emergency room, right? If you look at family medicine, you work with adults and kids, mostly in the outpatient setting. If you work as an ENT doctor, an ear, nose, and throat doctor, you're working with kids and adults with head and neck issues, right? If you're a surgeon, you're, you're, you're working on kids and adults with different surgical uh, diseases, right? So um, it's not a crazy idea to have a doctor, you know, uh, specialize in working with kids and adults. But um, the specialty itself is different than, than, let's say, family medicine. It's very comparable to family medicine because you're, you're not doing a lot of obstetrics. So, so the way family medicine is built is adult care in the hospital, out of the hospital, pediatric care, in and out of the hospital, and then ob gyn care in and out of the hospital. And then you get a little bit of orthopedics, a little bit of neurology, a little bit of psychiatry, right? Because our family doctors have to do a lot of stuff outpatient. And if you're in the middle of nowhere, and there's none of these specialists around, it's important to know the most common conditions in those kind of you know, specialties so that you can help the people out, especially if they don't have access to it. Med-peds is, takes away the, the ob -GYN. You, you don't really do orthopedics. It's not part of your rotation, uh, but you can, you know, the, the, there's like elective time. So you can use your elective time to, to, um, you know, choose to do orthopedics or neurology or whatever your specialty is. I'm obviously going into pulm crit. So I use a lot of my elective time to work with pulmonologists and ICU doctors. Um, neurology, we do a little rotations in, and then we have a lot of adults and, and kids, like just general medicine. And that general medicine goes into the ICU and it goes into the ER. And adults and, and kids as well. But um, what makes med peds different is most of your training in comparison to family medicine is in the hospital, right? So these patients that are in the hospital have an acute medical issue. They have a problem that needs to be dealt with right now for whatever reason, right? Because if they didn't, then why would they be there, right? They would be in the outpatient setting, maybe seeing a doctor every once a month, like fall tracking their progress, right? Are we treating their thyroid condition? Okay, we give them a thyroid med, they come back and they get labs. Oh, their thyroid numbers are still low. So we should go up on the medication, right? It's not an emergent situation. So, um, yeah, that's why med peds is, I think is a lot of fun. And when I was in medical school, um, I had exposure, you know, you get exposure to every field. Um, you, you, you rotate in all the major specialties, general surgery, pediatrics, internal medicine, neurology. Um, what else do you rotate in? ob right? The major ones. And I loved pediatrics. I worked with kids like my whole life. So it made sense to me from like a social standpoint. Like I love working with kids. I want that to be a part of my job. Um, and then the internal medicine aspect of it was so interesting. I love the inpatient care. I love the acuity, the different types of medical conditions, looking at x-rays and radiographs, uh, understanding different lab values and really delving into every organ system and every little part of um, the, that patient and trying to help them while they're in the hospital, right? Because in the outpatient setting, you know, you really just have your two hands, your eyes and your patient, right? And you have to kind of figure out a lot of what's going on without having all of these things that you're at your fingertips, right? You don't have an x-ray in the room all the time, or you don't have labs in your, in your clinic, right? Um, so that's why I chose my specialty. I think things to think about even now. So like, you know, I assume most of you all are not in medical school. That's why we were all talking. Um, even now, before you're applying to medical school, think about what being a doctor or a PA or an NP or whatever kind of practitioner you're thinking of being, think about what that means means to you, right? Does a doctor mean, you know, the guy who's the outpatient doctor or the gal who's, who's been your outpatient family medicine doctor? Or was it that one doctor you saw when you went to the ER? Is that what you envision as a doctor? Or was it when you went and you uh, went to your cousin's birth um, and visited them in the hospital and saw the pediatrician come in checking the baby and giving you tips on how to take care of your kid? Like, what's your vision of what a doctor is? Then look at that and say, okay, if that's what I envision a doctor, that's what I like about being a doctor. Take that, hold on to it, put that away. Do your research, look into all the fields of medicine and think, okay, this interests me. Look at all these options. Okay, so let's say you go through all these options and you're like neurosurgery. Well, that's, that's cool, right? The brain surgery, it's a very cool job. Everyone thinks it's a, 
it's a hot shot job, uh, but it takes a long time, right? You've got four years of medical school, four years of college, sorry, as well, seven years of residency, and then one to two years of a specialty. So if you do the math, that's like 20, that's like a long time. That's a lot of residency. So if you have kids, if you want to travel the world, are you going to be able to do all those things while you're working to be a neurosurgeon? Maybe, I don't know, but you, you can only decide what your capabilities and what your limits are, right? Of, of, of what you're, what you're able to do and you'll grow and get better. And, and that's part of the issue too, right? You're going to be a different person in 10 years. So maybe by the time you finish med school and you're applying for residency, you're going to be like, Oh, I actually hate kids. And I like love surgery. I'm going to be a surgeon. You know what I mean? So just think about this and constantly evaluate, right? And so maybe you just like doing procedures. Maybe you think that's cool. Well, you can go to PA school and be a PA and then just work under a surgeon and do procedures with them. And then you don't have to go through all this other BS of medical school and residency and fellowship, right? So you got to think about, you got to do your research. Um, but yeah, that's, that's what I would say at, at your point right now. Think about what a doctor means to you and then look at that path. And like, is that a path that you want to be on? And then always keep in mind, like, I feel like I, when I was at your guys' stage, like all I was thinking about was, oh, like I need to be a doctor. Like all I'm thinking about right now, but you gotta live in the moment too. You got, there's other, there's other aspects of life as well. You gotta enjoy your life, enjoy your friends, enjoy your family, enjoy your dog, um, whatever it is. And try to enjoy life while it's going on because by the end of it, you're gonna be like 35 and you're gonna be like, whoa, where did like my life go? I've just been studying, right? Okay. That was the first question. Jennifer, thank you for the question. I really went off on a tangent there. Um, all right. Could, I'm not going to, I hope I don't butcher this name. It's a cool name. Khadija Laskar. Laskar. Cool name. Did I get it? <laughs> okay. Have you came across any sort of difficulty when working in this field? I'm sure it's not easy, lol. How did you respond slash deal with it? Yeah. Oh my gosh. So every time you start a new chunk, so you start, you start college or you start you know, medical school, or you start residency, that beginning chunk is like, you crazy curve so hard, then you start to figure it out. And it's a slow rise, right? In difficulty or in like challenges, whatever. And then you get the next part. And it's like a, so it's, it's, there's always a challenge. That's why I say it's important to have the, that support and your coping strategies on how to deal with stress and like figuring out how to troubleshoot, right? So if I'm in the ICU, my patient's crashing, right? I can take the, those same skills. So for example, uh, my patient's crashing and I am looking for um, an IV. I got to place an IV in this patient because they need fluids because their blood pressure is really low or they need vasopressors, right? They need blood pressure everywhere, right? You kind of, you know what? Let, let's go get the drill and let's go do an intraosseous um uh gun go into their bone and then i can inject that that fluid there and that'll get into their bloodstream right so in that moment like right like we can we can predict and and prepare but like a lot of things just come up right so and you're going to do that too along your career you're going to you're going to prepare and try to predict how this next part of your journey is going to go and you might not be right all the time so you might run into some struggles right i've run into a lot of really smart people who like never struggle but that wasn't me i like you know i i had a tough time so coping and figuring out how to deal with your stress, troubleshooting and figuring out and how to move on. That's, that's like really important too. So um, uh, every aspect of your life outside of your schooling right now is important as well. Just like your life skills are important as well. Um, so have I come across any sort of difficulty in this field? Uh, yes, constantly. How did I respond to it? So how did I respond and deal with it? I have my family I can talk to. I've even, you know, seen a counselor sometimes if I'm really going through something and I can't do it, I see a counselor. Maybe I see a doctor, if there's anything a doctor can do to help me out, right? Maybe I meditate. I started meditating lately when I get stressed out. It works amazingly. I always was like, well, that's BS, there's no way. It totally works. Meditating is great. Um, just different coping strategies, right? And if I'm like trying to figure out information, right? If like I have this patient with a disease that comes in and I'm like, oh my God, I totally forgot from medical school, like how to treat this. Well, you're not just going to do nothing. You got to go and, and figure out how to do it. So you're going to take a breath. <sighs> okay. I don't know what to do, but I'm going to figure it out. I've got friendship, you know, friends around me, I've got information around me. I'm going to go get it. So I'll go on the computer, go to my resources, figure out what to do. 
you know, approach it in a, in a, you know, an organized and systemic way, and then maybe get my answer. And if I can't get the answer, I call for help. You're never really alone in medicine. There's all, a lot of doctors around who specialize and can help each other out because we all want the best for our patients. Hope that answered the question. Uh, older Aguilar, older, was that right? Yes, cool name. I feel like I've seen you in a, have I seen you in a chat before? Maybe not. Not sure. Uh, yeah. Not sure, you look familiar, okay. So I like the background by with the books, very uh, prestigious looking. Um, so is research part of your residency? Uh, it is and it isn't. So some residencies require that you do research and usually to get into medical school, it's recommended you do a little bit of research. Usually while you're in medical school, it's recommended to do research so that it, it just looks good. It's just extracurricular. It just shows that you're interested in, in knowing more, helping the current knowledge base of the, of the. So yeah, in a way like at our, you know, I, I work in an academic big, you know, a, a big hospital center that's attached to a university. So we're very academic and research is a, you, you need to do one, well, only one research project throughout your four years. Uh, I'm on like number four or five now because I, I find it interesting and I have time, right? As I, as I figured out and gone through those exponential humps and flattened out, I've been able to say, okay, I got my bearings. Why don't I try to like help out a little bit more or progress or learn more. And I jump onto a research project, do a little bit of work. And when it gets hard, okay, maybe I'm off the research for a little bit while I like figure everything else in my life out, right? And that's just a part of life. Again, going back to your normal you know, life skills. Um, so I think it's very interesting. Um, it's very nuanced. Uh, I am by no means a professional or a master of, of it. I actually have a, uh, a PI, they call it, um, who is helping me grow as a researcher and understand the research and we're publishing different things together and it's a lot of fun when you put your work out there and you have the journal in your hand and it's your book and people around the country are reading it that's pretty cool right that's pretty cool um jennifer said thank you let me open the door i think my dog wants to come out oh he's <laughs> he's outside <already. laughs> he was sitting under the table this is zeus uh, he's sitting here too okay all right, so neural. What would you say was the most challenging part of your journey thus far? Wow, you guys just want to hear what the most challenging things. You know, starting as an intern, my first year. From a student who was just kind of sitting back, listening, watching, not an active performer in patient care, to suddenly, um, you know, being uh, a doctor, right? So like one day you're a med student and then the next day you're a doctor. And there's a lot of people who experience imposter syndrome, which just essentially means you don't feel like you're a doctor, but you are a doctor. Um, so I, you know, I, I basically just uh, struggled with that and I didn't, quite know, you know, all the moves, right? Uh, that, that, that I'm supposed to make with a patient, maybe who comes in with shortness of breath. Like, what do I even, how do I even start with this, right? Like I have all this knowledge in my head from medical school. I don't even know how to organize it and apply it. So that first year of resident, uh, of residency, that, that intern year is, is critical. And it's like a pivotal time for you to like figure out, okay, this is a tough time. Again, I've gone through tough times before. I got to figure out how to deal with this. But it's like nothing you've ever dealt with before, right? As a high schooler, you've been like kind of a passive learner and you haven't really had to act or teach or do, right? You, you might have your extracurriculars, but you're not doing. Medical school is the same and, and call doing it. So that was really difficult for me. And it took me a long time. That was really one of my most stressful times. It was really emotionally draining. I needed support from my family, from my friends. I was alone on Long Island by myself with all my family across the country in California. And it was really tough because every day was just a struggle. And there really wasn't an uptick at all. Every day was just hard, hard, hard. So I was just getting hammered in. But eventually I figured it out. I reached out to people um, who I thought might help me. Uh, people reached out to me seeing that I needed help and I figured it out. And now what I do, because I know how hard it is and I was probably one of the people that's most affected by that, in my opinion, I go out and I do these talks and I go out and when I have interns that are on, I, before I even meet them, I say, listen, my name's Jeremy. I had a terrible time as an intern. 
and it's going to be okay. And you're going to figure this out and we're going to get through this together. And that's it. And uh, going off of that, I, I believe in like a positive work environment. Sometimes that's not the case. And a lot of people might not believe in that. So that's something you have to do it too, right? More life skills, more life skills. All right. Khadija Laskar, she saw my IG post about Zeus living in his life, living his life, lol. Yes, yes, Zeus is a very famous, very famous Instagram dog. You should check him out. Um, thanks for following, that's nice of you. Um, Tamara Cabrejos, would you say you were learning constantly even as a resident? Yes, as, a, as like an attending doctor, as a med yeah, it's constant learning. If, if you're sick of learning, you don't like learning, uh, <laughs> and you just wanna keep doing the same thing, it's not for you. You always got to read. You always got to read. Like you're dedicating your life. You think like you're just going to be Dr. House or Scrubs or Grey's Anatomy, like walking about, you know, just wake up every day, just walk around with your, your white coat cape and just everything's going to be grand. And you're going to be like, I'm a doctor. It's not like that. That's what I thought it was. It's not like that. People actually expect things out of you. And you're just expected to know how to treat a patient in a nuanced condition that nobody knows how to treat. And everyone looks at you. There's 10 people in the room and they look at you. What are you going to do? So you, you got to, you know, you got to do some behind the scenes work. So reading journals, reading textbooks, um, reviewing because that stuff doesn't stay in your head, right? I might read a, 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 a book or a paragraph 10 times over the course of five years. And each time I'm reading that paragraph, like, it, like I've never seen it before, right? So being... Uh, uh, resilient, right? And, and understanding that, you know, uh, things don't always go the way you want it. And again, figuring out how to troubleshoot that. Okay, so if I can't remember this, what am I going to do? Oh, maybe I'll put a calendar notification every Saturday to remind me this. And then over the course, course of four weeks, maybe it'll be drilled into my head. And after I've reviewed this topic, I'll know it now. Now I can talk about it. And that's what I do. quick like multiple choice one plus one thing it's like a very involved with a full patient in their whole life and the whole condition and you have to figure out what they have right and not only what they have but what to do or maybe what to do if that doesn't work and what to do next so these questions are, are big time and by the way I, I i don't think i was ever the smartest person in my class nor was i in the middle of my class i think i was just a very like average student but i work hard and that's really all you need um, that's really all you need. And if it doesn't go the way you like it, you keep trying, you try again, right? You, maybe you don't go into medical school right out of college. Maybe it's going to take you a little bit longer. Maybe you take a year off, do some research, study a little bit more, or take the MCAT again. Maybe you, that year doesn't work. You go back again, but maybe you end up thinking, listen, I'm just going to apply to the Caribbean. I'll be a doctor there and I can still be a doctor coming out of it, right? Drop the ego, right? So there's lots of ways to get into it. There's lots of ways to do it. Um, but you gotta be a problem solver. You gotta be a MacGyver because the, the road is not intuitive. It doesn't go the way you want it to go all the time. By the way, I'm gonna answer all these questions uh, and I'll stay on as long as you guys want because I, I, I'm not doing anything. But um, if I don't answer your questions or if you have a private question you wanna ask me, just message me on Instagram, I, I do respond, okay? I'm not Brad Pitt. I wish I was, but I'm not. So I, I have the time to respond. All right, would you say, Okay, how was your experience with taking the MCAT? Horrible. Oh my God, I hate the MCAT, but you just got to do it. You know what I mean? You just got to do it. I took a class, uh, Kaplan. Kaplan's great. I would just do Kaplan. I did a, um, it was like recorded videos class. I thought that that was good enough because I feel like they're giving you all the information. And the recorded videos, I would argue, are probably better than any of the live videos because the recorded videos are being screened by the organization. So they have to include all the like required information, right? Maybe a live person might forget a few facts here and there, but the benefit of the live one is if something comes up in your head and you have a question, you can get it answered right there rather than just like going on Google and looking it up yourself, right? So it's like six to one, half a dozen, but I, 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 if you can afford it, I recommend the class. I'm sure there's a lot of like free files you can get online with like full, full study reviews. And you know, if you don't have the cash, then you know, maybe try that out and see how it goes. Um, I got like a decent score on my MCAT. I took the old MCAT and then I took the new MCAT. So that the new eight hour one before the one was, well, you know, I did fine. And, uh, again, I'm not that smart. So I'm assuming most of you guys are smart because you're involved in these like virtual shadowings already. Some of you might even be in high school and looking at this. So you guys are way ahead of the game. Okay. 
Um, that's my advice for the MCAT. If you have any more questions, Rita, um, if I'm saying that right, hopefully, just let me know and we can talk about it. Older. How are you able to manage all your tasks? Do you have all your responsibility? Um, yeah, I, I calendar the heck out of my life. That's like most important. But I think what's great about a calendar is you could just like unload your guilt and your stress by instead of thinking, oh my God, this whole week I have all this stuff to do. You can just say, well, I'm going to do what my calendar says. You got to sit down on Saturday or Sunday, look through all, everything you need to do, put it into a time slot throughout the week. And then boom, you have like a personal manager who's going to tell you what you're doing all week. And you just, as long as you dedicate yourself to getting it done that day, don't be a procrastinator. It's going to get done and you'll do it. And then you won't have to worry about the next day and the next day. Cause all you're, all you have to do is say, oh, well, this is what my calendar says I'm going to do today. So the rest of the day, I'm going to take it off. I'm going to enjoy myself. I'm going to play with my dog. I'm going to go outside and run. I'm going to go out with my friends, right? That's important to do, right? Mental health. You got to like manage this stuff, right? Right at your point, even at my point, you're thinking about like 10 years in the future. Like, oh my God, I got so much stuff to do. Oh my God, dude, I got like school and I got like research and oh my God, dude, the amount of not. You can't think like that. You got to think day by day. So the way kind of the rule of thumb is I would say, as I, and I tell my interns as well, as I say, think about a month ahead. Think about a month ahead, what needs to get done and kind of just delineate. All right, this week, I'm going to get these things done. This week, I'm going to get these things done. These, this week, I'm going to get these things done. And then the Saturday before each week, you'll hour or day, day what you're going to get. Um, and that way, you, you know, you don't have to stress about it too much. You don't have to stress about it too much. Um, sometimes I do a year planner too. It's, some people like those paper planners. You guys should have been born in the 1940s, but some people like those. I like my, you know, my iPhone. It connects everywhere. So whatever, whatever it takes. That's just me if, uh, privately older if you have a specific question about that, okay? Um, use a calendar. No one's better than a calendar. I, I don't care who you are. It also just makes you feel better about it because you're not like holding on to like, oh, what do I need to do? <coughs> Husna, Husna Muhammad, cool name. How often do you come across something you are unfamiliar with in your specialty considering healthcare involves so much problem solving? Well, the first time you do every rotation, it's gonna, everything's gonna be new. The second time, like maybe 40, 50% is gonna be new. And then each time you do after that, less and less becomes unfamiliar. So each rotation depends, but it could be a week, two weeks, three weeks, a month. And the more you just get exposure to it, the better. <clears throat> I, I'm, there's different types of learners. I'm a type of learner who learns by experience. There's a lot of people who just have like this intuitive like way to like solve problems. And they're just like so smart and like they just get it. I, I, I don't. I have to mess up like five times. And then I go, okay. I don't do that anymore. Moving on. I won't do that again. So, um, for example, I'm on pediatric diagnosed with, with some hip pain and he's, you know, been just followed. They thought it was a muscular thing. Turns out he has a huge, this big, and then a little 12 year old kid, huge tumor. It's called a neuroblastoma sitting on his right below his liver on top of his kidneys right now. He's literally, He's like in the hospital right now. I've been working with him every day. And that's so scary. And he's got metastasis, meaning pieces of it have gone everywhere, which is a horrible prognosis. So, you know, the, the odds of this guy surviving are so low. So poor him, right? Of course, poor him. That's just a horrible, what a horrible thing to happen, right? But for me, that's tough too, knowing that information, right? And dealing with that and working with that. I have to process those emotions too. I'm a real human being. So that's difficult too, right? But, and, and that's, you know, oncology, maybe on the wards, I have a patient who blood pressure is going like this and I, all day. Doing this, da, 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 and taking a lot of my attention away from my other patients. That's stressful in itself too. There's different types of stressors. So as long as you have coping strategies, again, these life skills that you're going to get outside of your academics, um, they'll be better off later down the road. So start working on that now, right? How do you guys deal with stress when you get stressed out right now? What are you, what, what are you all doing? Are you just crying, freaking out? Or are you saying kind of after you've cried, step back and say, okay, why did, why did this make me upset? How can I prevent it again? And what can I learn from this, right? So that's kind of it.
I, I don't know if I need to go into specifics in that question, but but that's kind of how I'm going to answer it. Do you have a specific question? Anyone have specifics? Everyone has a lot of general questions, which I'm happy to. Answer. You guys have any questions about what you should be doing now? Okay, Rita, Rita Haddad. Do we have two? Oh, we have a Rita and we have a Rita. How do you compartmentalize your emotions when dealing with things such as death of, oh, such as death of a patient? Um, I think that's person to person. Some people just are not good at that, and maybe they won't go into a field with a lot of death. Right? They might go into pediatrics, which might be a nicer field to go into. I, I think I'm lucky in that I can. I just naturally compartmentalize. If I'm not like um, related or have a relationship with that person, a lot of times I can have sympathy and empathy, but not like this full blown, like feeling like I am that person. So, you know, you can feel for a person and you can understand that they're going through a difficult time and you can be there for them and you can process that emotion and, and you know, it could be hard on you. But, um, you know, there's going to be a lot of emotional and difficult situations. So, um, you know, you step back and you learn. You might see, but it might be one that you learn in residency. That might be your difficult time as an intern year, uh, you know, in your intern year. That might be the thing that shakes you and makes it, you know, hard for you to go on. So again, coping strategies, figuring out how to deal with those emotions, right? Meditation, talking to friends, talking to family, talking to a counselor. Medication is always okay as well. If that works for you. Okay. Um, newer poor goal. What's some advice you'd give your younger self that you wish you had heard from before? Ooh, that's a good one. That's deep. Um, don't uh, be so hard on yourself. Don't think that being a doctor is everything in this world because it's not. I guarantee you I'm here now and I'm like still not always like happy and like content and like fulfilled. Like there's more to life. Sometimes I, I've worked like 80 hour work weeks and I'm like 12, 13, 14 hours a day, six, seven days a week. And I'm just like, what am I doing? It's the same stuff every day, right? I might have like five patients that died if I'm working on the ICU. So that's pretty heavy. Or maybe that's just like getting old now. Maybe I've lost my emotion because it just keeps happening, right? It varies from week to week. Um, so nonetheless, like there's not like one thing that being a doctor is not just like gonna be the one that solves everything. It's gonna make you happy. There's so much more to life. And I, I would tell my younger self, and I'm telling you all to enjoy the other things in life, the things outside of medicine, because it will be a big part of your life. And you're going to want to have other aspects of your life that bring you happiness and joy, right? So work on those now, right? You don't need to be a doctor to work on those. And uh, if you want to be an ultimate lacrosse or fence player, Hold on, there's someone at the door. One sec. Um, if you want to be an ultimate lacrosse defense player, you know, go work on that. You have time. You can work on that. Um, hopefully that answers your question. Um, what's some advice you'd give your own self? Can you talk, so Parshva, can you talk about your experience as an undergraduate student and how you prepared for medical school? Undergrad, in my opinion, as far as like internal stress, because you're just stressed about your uncertainty of your future, undergrad is like the most stressful, in my opinion. Because you're like, so much uncertain work. I don't even know if I'm going to get into med school. I don't even know if I'm going to like it, right? So I feel for you guys. I know how hard it was um, and how hard it is. So uh, what did I do as an undergrad? I was a bio major. It got so hard. The first year of bio was so difficult. And then I, I got to a point where I was like, you know, maybe this isn't for me. This is a lot of work. Maybe I'll just be a psychologist. I can still help people. So then I switched to psych for a little bit. And then I was like, well, I just don't want to hear people complain all day. I like want a little bit more stimulation. So I was like, oh crap. And because I was like switching between the two, I just decided to do both. So I did bio and psych as an undergrad. And I don't think that makes me super smart. I think that just makes me indecisive. And I just worked harder. I just worked every summer. I didn't have a summer off in college because I couldn't make up my mind. As you can see now, I couldn't make up my mind. I did med peds. And you can see in the future, I won't be making up my mind because I'm doing pulmonology and critical care medicine, right? So it's just perpetual indecisiveness with me. And that's okay. 
because it, that's how I've solved the problem of picking between the two. I just pick both. But maybe you, with your indecisiveness, do pick one, but have strategies, maybe a pros and cons list, um, maybe talking to people, getting people's opinions, just how you deal with uncertainty and emotion and problems, right? MacGyvering your way through things. So I've just MacGyvered my way through things by like not deciding. So I did that. I was in a fraternity um, because I needed some social aspect of my life. I was a commuter. I didn't live at the college. So that was always difficult for me to just show up to school and then leave. So I needed like a group of friends, a group of guys who I could just hang out with and talk to. So I had that. <clears throat> um, I did a little bit of research, but it was like BS research because like I was just trying to get into med school. I didn't publish anything. Um, what else did I do? I was, I worked at like a summer camp for diabetics for like 10 years leading up into college. And that was like my volunteer thing. And that looks pretty good for my apps, I think. And as a diabetic, uh, I worked a little bit. I used to play guitar at my religious school once a week. They give me a little bit of cash to buy food for that week. It would be kind of nice, but it was hard. I mean, the classes are difficult and then, and the information is so nuanced and some of it, you're just like, why am I learning this? Like this doesn't even apply to medicine, right? You're just like, well, but if I can be honest with you, a lot of it does. A lot of it actually does. When you think something, oh, this is not going to matter. I can't tell you how many times I did that in medical school too. This is not going to matter. Why am I going to know this? There's a reason they're teaching it to you. It matters. It really matters. So if that helps you out in any way, like get motivated to study, you know, like drawing those molecules of like calcium phosphate, that's what's going to matter. Guess what? I give um, magnesium sulfate. I give calcium chloride. I give all of these things to people who are low on those. So knowing what they are, right? Calculating osmolarity, right? If, if I'm determining how much fluids I'm going to give somebody, right? That's actually, <laughs> it's important, surprisingly. So guess what? I had to relearn it because I didn't commit it to memory. So commit it to memory. There's a one thing I can say to myself. Try to get into what you're learning because a lot of what the bio, which I'm assuming most of you are bio or pre-med oriented, a lot of it is important. It's applicable. Um, yeah, just don't be hard on yourselves. Just don't be hard on yourselves. Just work really hard. If you don't get it, if you don't get the A, if you don't get the B, if you get the D, but you worked your butt off, then you can't really, there's nothing else you can do. Take the different route next time and you'll figure it out. What else? Give me more questions. Um, just, to go on, just to go on my previous question. So do you recommend any particular classes that would that we should take as an undergrad that might help in medical school? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I think there's like anatomy classes you can take, which could be cool. Um, physiology, not cell physiology, but like human physiology. If that's a class you could take, I would take that. Understanding the direction of flow of blood, understanding how things develop. That's all very important and very applicable. Um, you know, if you want to take a psych class, like a bio psych class that can count for credits, that's like an easier A, but it's also, you know, important for um, being a doctor. Right? You want to be a counselor to your patients to some degree. You want to be able to talk and know some of them. You guys have specific questions about classes maybe that you're thinking about taking? It's okay if you don't. Khadija says anatomy is fun. It is fun. I like anatomy. I actually have, um, this is kind of a, a pro tip. I have a picture of, because I do a lot of um, special IV procedures where I insert like long IVs into people's arms that like kind of go into their major vessels and it's ultrasound guided. I basically put a wire through their vessel and then thread a catheter over it and then pull the wire out. And now I have like a nice catheter in a vessel. That's like sturdy. So I like bought a human anatomy on Amazon, uh, which everyone has access to, of all the veins and the arteries. 
So when I'm doing the ultrasound and looking at the vessels, I can name them and I can know where they lead. I can know how, where they go. And again, you learn this as a, as a med student, but you know, once you took the class and took, you know, took the test, it's like, psh, like, I don't need this anymore. Well, it turns out I did need it. So I relearned it and it's cool. So every time I, I actually put it right in front of my toilet. So every time I, I use the restroom, I just, you know, do a little bit of vein reading or artery reading. And uh, so it's constantly, you know, in my head, it goes back to that, you know, that one paragraph or that one piece of knowledge you're not remembering. You keep exposing yourself to it. And now every time I'm teaching, the, you know, because I teach this procedure to, to different, you know, doctors and med students, um, I have it in my head and it's like so available. It's like crystal clear rather than something remotely I learned years ago because I'm seeing it every day. So that's cool. Um, Khadija Laskar, do you want to talk about a case study? We have about eight minutes. Um, I could talk about a case study. Does anyone have any more like questions? Like, yeah, I mean, I could just tell you about like different patients I've seen. What do you guys want to talk about? Do you guys want to do a case study? Put it in the chat. Do you have a question? Case study? Do you want me to talk about more? <clears throat> about like what a day in the life of a doctor is like in the hospital because I had no clue what that meant even as a med student I didn't know like hour to hour what they're doing um I right, hear some questions um do you know anything about clinical laboratory science so are you referring so this is from Rahaf Al-Qadri it's a cool name too I have such a lame name you guys have cool names um, you're asking about any clinical laboratory. So I imagine you're talking about, you know, publishing clinical data in regards to like medicines and therapies for patients by working in the laboratory, or are you talking about clinical research where you're working with patients and it's more like out of the, the lab? Which one is it, Rahaf? Uh, We can't. I do Why don't you message me on Instagram? We'll chat about it. It sounds like you have a specific question about a different career path, maybe. Um, okay. Um, Amanda, the craziest patient story. Um, oh, that's a crazy patient story. A little drama, too. So I had a patient in the ICU who ended up having some weird, crazy stroke. Young guy, like 60s, who we call young. We Usually in the hospital, we don't call anyone old until they're like late 70s. So he was like 60s, had a family, had kids, all that. And he um, came in with this stroke and he had a really scary condition called locked in syndrome where because part of your brain got fried in the stroke, you're locked into your body. You can't move anything. And all you can do is move your eyes. Horrible, horrible condition. So we were trying sometimes you can recover i guess so we were trying to just work with him he was on a ventilator he was having gi bleeding profuse amounts of transfusions of blood were needed and uh, my dog keeps disappearing i don't trust that on the table Oh, man um so for two weeks we were trying to stabilize this guy and just figure out what was going on so i was talking to him because i could imagine everything that was racing through his mind this is one of my first patients ever in the icu so i was dealing with a lot of them. um i was using his eyes to tell him and i was got to a point after like sitting in there for like an hour in the room that he wanted to talk about his will for his family. <clears throat> so he, I guess he had a new wife with kids and he had an old wife with kids. So I was, um, you know, <laughs> I, I, I was trying to ask him if he was wanted to reach out to somebody, talk to a lawyer or a social worker. He said, yeah. And it sounded like he wanted to include this. I don't know if it was a secret family, but it was like another family in the will who hadn't really been around. Um, and the wife caught wind of it. And she fired me. She, she kicked me off the case. And 
you know, I felt kind of weird about it as a doctor. So she asked for a new doctor. So she got a new doctor, but I was like, well, that's kind of whack. Cause if he was talking, he would still want me on the case and he's the patient, but because he can't really talk, <clears throat> then that makes her the healthcare proxy and her to make all the decisions. So I don't know. It, it, he ended up dying. He ended up losing a lot of blood in his GI tract and basically bleeding out. Horrible way to go. Um, probably not painful though, because he, he just bled. So that's not painful, but um, very sad, very sad story. And ultimately I think it was his, the, his best route out of it. Cause I think he was going to be locked into his body forever. And uh, sometimes death is an appropriate answer in the ICU. Um, for some patients who just don't, won't have that quality of life. So that's my fun story, craziest patient story. All right, Sarah L. Marakbi, another cool name. Day in the life. All right, day in the life, here we go. I wake up, 5 a.m., go back to sleep, turn off the alarm, it's too early. 5.15, alarm buzzes, turn it off, go back to sleep, I'm too tired. 5.30, buzzes again, all right, crap, I gotta wake up, let's go. I get up, I actually have energy drinks I got into. Don't do energy drinks, but I got into it because I'm so tired all the time. I get an energy drink, brush my teeth, and then I go get Zeus, walk the dog, and then boom, I go to the hospital. It's about a half hour drive for me. Show up around 7 a.m. and I get signed out from the night doctor. So any of the patients that I'm in charge of were being... Um, we're being, watched, uh, we're being watched overnight. I have to know what happened, right? You need to have a doctor there at all times, right? So that doctor signs out all the patients to me, says, this is what happened with Mr. Johnson. This is what happened with Mrs. Blah, 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 blah. This guy had an x-ray. This gal had a CT scan. This girl died, whatever. So I get all the sign out. And then I go myself. I round on the patients, look at new images, new x-rays, new laboratory values, new blood tests make orders, send people home, and basically make plans for everyone, right? Should this, does this patient need to stay here? Does this patient need to go home? Need to change our management. And that goes on for a few hours. Then I get lunch if I have time. I usually get a salad. I try. And I have a coffee. Round two of the day. Then in the afternoon, I check on my patients again, follow up anything, maybe discharge some, maybe get new patients from the ER that showed up. And then at 7 p.m., the doctor comes for the night and I sign out all the patients and he, he or she takes over and I go home. And that's how an inpatient system works for most services. For an outpatient service, you show up to your office at eight or nine, you see a patient every 15, 20 minutes, write a note, you know, order some tests, order some medication, and then send them home. And you do that, you know, so it's more quicker. And those patients are obviously not as sick. They're like, you know, healthier patients who can like function without constant 24 hour care in a hospital. Um, so that's kind of a day in the life. Exciting stuff. The bullet points. But um, there's, a, there's a day in the life that I did uh, like a video series, if you want to see it, uh, it's on pre-health shadowing. It's another page they did. I did one while I was in the pediatric emergency room a day in the life. So check it out if you want to see like kind of what it looks like. All right. Um, do you still come across medical equipment, which you don't know what it does? I've been volunteering at Project Cure and all the equipment's overwhelming. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, man. I mean, yeah, there's, there's always met, like, you know, machines you don't know about or equipment. But once you, you know, learn about it and you work with it, you know, you figure it out. But yeah, I mean, at your stage, like I would understand like 5% of it. Look for you, for volunteering. That's awesome. That's really cool. Um, uh, but, you know, but that being said, you know, you might not use all that medical equipment, right? That might be, so some of that medical equipment might be for an ENT or some of it might be for a plastic surgeon. Or some of it might be for a pulmonologist, right? So it's not like we're all using everything. Uh, so I would 
not wait till the week before to study. I would consistently study. Um, there's usually like a syllabus. I would study what you're supposed to do each week for the syllabus. And then on top of that, for that week and then the next week you'll review the new syllabus material and then go back and review the stuff from that week on like the Saturday of that week so you're putting new information in and then you're also reviewing the information from before and then boom the end of the semester comes you've seen all this information a few times you feel confident you're going to get a good grade and then of course you can cram at the end get any little other bits of information in your head and you're set that's how you should do it <clears throat> all right what else more more questions concerns again you can always message me privately um, i apologize i know it's it's over five now so <laughs> if, if you want to go like uh i don't think we have any more questions so i think we can we can wrap up the session all right awesome thank you so much for having me everyone best of luck uh summary tips don't be hard on yourself enjoy life outside of medicine it's not everything and try to have some fun and enjoy, you know, every every aspect of life. Okay. And keep trying. If you don't get it this year, try again next year. Keep going. All right. Thanks for having me.